Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the virtual learning course, Stream Restoration Design and Construction Considerations, the first of our infrastructure series. My name is Brittany Harlow, and I will be moderating today's session. The session will be provided via both audio and web conference. This program will last approximately 45 minutes, followed by a Q&A session. If you have a question at any point during today's presentation, you may submit it via the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. Please note that we will send attendees certificates of completion via email for PDH self-reporting purposes. And now it is my pleasure to introduce our speakers for today, Alex Luckadoo, Travis Spangler, and Katie Atkinson from Timmins Group. All right, thank you. Brittany for the introduction and thank you everyone for joining us today for our discussion on stream restoration. Uh, we'll be stepping through the process from the design standpoint through construction and then ultimately to project closeout, providing tips and lessons learned along the way that can be applied to a wide array of projects, uh, whether you're doing restoration for TMDL credit purposes, uh, mitigation credit purposes, or if you're simply preserving or protecting existing infrastructure. Our talk today will focus primarily on urban restoration projects, such as the one you see in the photo here. However, many of the concepts that we discuss can be applied to rural restoration projects as well. So just to put a couple of faces to the names here, um, I'm pictured there on the left and I'm joined on this slide by my colleagues and co-presenters. Katie Atkinson and Travis Spangler. Together we'll be covering the following topics. Um, Katie is gonna kick things off by discussing some common constraints or obstacles that we see with these urban restoration projects. And then she'll be focusing on one specific constraint which is the presence of existing storm sewer outfalls and then discussing how to incorporate those into your restoration design. After that, Travis will discuss some issues that you should look for during the pre-bid and pre-construction site visits and then I'll take over and talk about field changes um, and the importance of being flexible during the construction process and then Travis will discuss project closeout and then at that point we will open things up to Q&A. So with that I will turn things over to Katie Atkinson. Thanks Alex. Good morning everyone. I'm going to start really big picture a lot of what we deal with with urban stream restoration deals with a lot of constraints that we find on site pretty frequently and I'm just going to hit on a few of those. Next. We see a lot of utility crossings on site. They can be sewer, electric, cable, anything, all of the above. You can see the picture on the left. We have a sewer line crossing through the bed of our stream. We'll also see some sewer lines suspended above the stream just due to erosion over time like in the center picture. And off to the right, we even have some utilities that have actually been constructed to be suspended about 10 feet above the stream center. So lots of interesting things with utility crossings. Next. Another big thing that we deal with on site are, is finding an earthwork balance between our cut and fill with our projects. I'm pictured in the picture on the right. I'm five foot four. So you can see how tall that bank is and how much cut we're dealing with there versus the fill that we're gonna to need to account for in our design. So it can get pretty complicated pretty quickly with the earthwork balance. Next. Um, when it comes to an urban site, there are a lot of people in urban areas, which means a lot of property lines. This is an actual project that we worked on that spanned 23 different property owners and we had to get everyone on board with our design and grading into their backyards and letting a little bit of easement into their property, which is understandably a big task. Next. All right, and finally, we see a ton of outfalls and culverts that are transporting flows to our streams. This is what my big focus for the rest of my presentation is gonna be. So many of these culverts come in damaged, and I'm just gonna go over a few of the issues that we commonly see with them. Sometimes the bottoms will uh, rust out, like you can see on the picture on the left, and on the right you can see some broken concrete, which is a pretty common sight. Pipes will often separate over time as well. They just kind of come apart at the seams. 
just because they're old or undersized and that can cause backwater behind the end wall and will eventually cause that end wall to wash away. It can also cause additional sediment transport coming downstream. Clogged pipes are pretty common in an urban area, especially in areas of lots of development. There can be projects, project sites upstream that just don't have the proper ENS control measures to control that sediment moving downstream into our outfall. And that can cause the sediment to build up. You also see a lot of ponding of water and flooding and the damage that is associated with flooding can come with these clogged pipes. As the banks erode away, the pipes can become undercut and eventually just begin to hang over the stream, as you can see in these two pictures. And over time, these pipes will eventually fall into the stream and that water outfalling will cause even more damage to the bank. Next. Finally, we have wild cards, which are my personal favorite because you just never really know what you're gonna find. The picture off to the left, we believe that um, that culvert was installed sometime in the 1980s and might have been functioning at one point, but as we see it today, it's just kind of fallen down the bank and is acting as sort of wonky grade control for that left bank, which is very interesting. And then off to the right, just a good reminder that we're working in nature and nature is going to do what nature wants to do. So if a tree wants to grow around an outfall, it's going to grow and you just have to work with that. All right, so all of these outfalls seem to have a ton of issues, damaged, broken. Um, there has to kind of be a common theme. Why are these outfalls breaking? And one of the main reasons that we can point to is that a lot of these outfalls were sized at a time where there wasn't as much development and therefore not as much water moving as quickly into these outfalls. So they're just undersized for the flows that they're receiving today. And that causes erosion like you can see in the picture on the right. In the top center of that picture is our outfall, and you can see a pretty massive down cut just from um, a high velocity of water moving out of that pipe. Next. So I sort of briefly touched on this, but development is a big contributor to the water and the velocity of the water that heads to these outfalls. This is a pretty typical urban drainage area that we'll work in. The dark gray is the impervious surface, whereas the light blue is the open area that's pervious. This, air, this drainage basin is about 43.7% impervious. So that means that when water hits 43.7% of it, it doesn't have time to absorb into that soil. So it comes into our outfalls at a fast velocity and just kind of shoots out way too fast into our stream and cuts away our sediment and moves it downstream. I'd be willing to bet that 20 years ago when these outfalls were designed and sized, there wasn't this much development within the drainage area. So that's a lot of the, the source of a lot of our issues. Next. All right, so how do we coordinate our stream design with these outfalls and the issues that we see in site? I've broken it down into a pretty simplified two-step process. For step one, we try to repair and replace what's already out there. We typically will cut back the existing pipe and retrofit with a drop structure and a new pipe. We will also add an end wall if we're able to, to provide for more bank stabilization so that we don't really see this issue in the future. We also try to grade in a plunge pool just to, just to slow that energy, slow the water coming in, just to dissipate some energy so that the water can flow in a little bit slower and cause less erosion over time. You can see in the center picture, that's a good example of a plunge pool with a berm. And then the berm sort of acts as a level spreader so that the water slows out, slows down, spreads across our floodplain, and then drops into our channel. The picture on the right shows a drop structure, which is effective in cutting down the slope of the pipe. So we can account for some of that eroded away bank and then um, lessen the slope of the pipe so that the water can flow in a little bit slower. Next. These are two projects that are in progress. The picture on the left shows a pretty large drop structure as well as a brand new culvert being installed. So that's pretty typical of what you'll see. In the picture on the right, it's not complete, but you can see the grading and the outlet protection with that riprap as the water comes in. We want 
the riprap to sort of slow the water down and protect the bank. Next. So once you address the issue with the structure itself, we like to move on to our stream and what can we do with our stream to help this water slow down. Within stream anatomy, there are areas called riffles that are fast and that are fast moving water and pools that are slow, deep moving water. So when it comes to outfalls and introducing outside water sources into our stream system, we definitely want that outer out water, the outside water to hit the pool at the deep sluggish part of the pool, which is typically the outer meander. The picture on the left is an example of an outfall that's been designed to hit at the outer bend or a pool where the water is slow and deep so that water has time to dissipate its energy and come in and not cause excess erosion. Next. So it seems pretty simple. Fix what's out there align your alignment so that the outfalls can hit at an outer bend, but sometimes it's not always that easy. A lot of the times with these projects, we'll have budgetary constraints and they might not necessarily be able to put in an end wall, for example, or drop in a so What we like to do is just cut back the existing pipe, grade in a large plunge pool to slow that water down and then let it come across our floodplain slower. You can also have multiple outfalls hitting at coming in from different directions. The point where it's possible to hit outfall at an outer bend. This is an example of that in the picture on the right. We had multiple outfalls coming in. So again, just a similar solution is to give it as much floodplain as possible to spread across, as well as a plunge pool to slow that water down as it outfalls out of that pipe. Next. So in everything, there are wildcard cases, especially with outfalls. This is a very interesting situation. The picture on the left shows a Google Earth image of um, a property in central Virginia. The, just to give some background information, the landowner who owns this lot had this whole parking lot and the green space above it to become more parking lot in the future if he wanted. So he installed curb and gutter, which is highlighted with the yellow arrow. So that curb and gutter runs all along that green space and then even had an inlet, a curb inlet, as you can see in the picture on the right. That's actually the curb inlet, that's part of that curb and gutter on the grass. And then just to complicate things off to the right, we had a BMP or best management practice pond out falling into our stream and the outfall for that is highlighted with the red arrow. So what was happening was stormwater was coming across the parking lot, hitting this curb and the damaged inlet and having nowhere to go, it was destroying that concrete and then hopping the curb and causing a lot, and causing a lot of down cut by the BMP outfall. So just a whole mess. You can see the broken concrete in the picture on the right. And if you go to the next slide, there's this, on the picture on the left is more of that broken concrete that's totally fallen into our stream and the broken culvert, which actually was the outfall, I believe, from that uh, storm inlet. And the picture on the right, it's a little hard to see, but if you look at that red arrow, that's actually the down cut from the water jumping that curb and then hitting the outfall from that pond off to the right. So you just never really know what you're gonna see. <laughs> Next slide. To fix this, we had to get a little creative. We started by grading our bank to pull some of that drainage away from the BMP outlet and more towards a retrofitted outfall that we fixed from what was existing out there. So sort of like what I mentioned before, we added a drop structure, new pipes, an end wall, graded in a plunge pool, and then graded the earth around it to sort of drain towards that inlet versus over towards the BMP pond. So that's what we did. <laughs> Next slide. Okay, and just to finish up, here are some examples of outfall projects that can be seen on site. Off to the left, you can see one that's outfalling from a BMP pond or from road drainage right below it. In the middle, we have a culvert outfall, which probably had a pretty large drainage area, which is why we added in a plunge pool. Right below that, we have more road drainage, more intermittent drainage that we like to add more rock to. 
And off to the right with the step pool system, that steep slope allowed us to add in some steps as the water moved down. Okay, I'm gonna pass it off to Travis. Thanks, Katie. <clears throat> so as Alex mentioned previously uh, during the intro, stream restorations can be implemented for a variety of reasons. As of late, we've seen a, a high proportion of our projects being implemented to reduce pollutant loads to downstream waters. One of the ways we uh, quantify pollutant loads is through the bank's analysis. Uh, this combines a BHI score and an air bank stress to give a total sediment loss per foot, linear foot of channel. And then we can extrapolate that through the entire reach length that we have to get a total pollutant load reduction from a rest restored project. So one thing to consider here is uh, that stream restoration projects sometimes can take two, three years or longer to get implemented. And this bank's analysis is typically done on the front end of a project, you know, in the first year or six months or so to uh, identify viability of the project. Well, if the projects get pushed out two or three years, and you have a rapidly degrading system with accelerated erosion, you may run into instances where your stream is in much worse condition pre-construction than it was when you originally collected your data. So we started doing pre-construction uh, banks analysis and it doesn't take very long. And you can see from the pictures here, uh, conditions can change, change quite drastically. The photo on the left and right are the same bank uh, within a couple years of each other. And you can see that the bank erosion hazard index score increased significantly because we lost a lot of rooting depth from a bank failure. So in this particular instance, we'd see increased pollutant load uh, going downstream, thus uh, giving us more credit for our project. Next. So it's also important uh, along those same lines when the projects get stretched out two, three, four years, to walk your limits of grading and your limits of disturbance before construction or preferably before your pre-bid meeting. That way you can identify any areas that differ from your current design. This, uh, in this particular instance, you can see the photo on the left, there's a large failing bank with some geotextile fabric exposed. That particular spot on that slope was actually outside of our limits of grading and our limits of disturbance uh, as originally designed. So catching this during the pre-bid, we could talk with the contractor about it and then show them during the pre-construction meeting and also work with the locality to get that limit of limits of disturbance moved and get those grading changes implemented so we don't tie back into a slope that's really not stable and good for the long-term health of the project. Next. So along those same lines, uh, Accelerated erosion and degradation in your channels can actually expose utilities that you may have not known were there, or if they were there, they weren't exposed prior to your project. Um, so this is always something to look out for during your pre-construction walk, and typically your contractors call the local entity involved with identifying uh, utilities before excavation happens. Some of these will get identified and some of them be exposed. So the picture on the left, uh, the circled area shows an exposed communication line that wasn't previously exposed during design phase of the project. So this is something we had to work around on the fly during construction. You can see in the middle picture, they worked around that exposed communication line. They were able to move it and build their channel, put in their soil lifts and matting. And then they came back, uh, shown in on the photo on the right here. Uh, they tucked that communication line back under the matting, under the uh, cobble in the stream, up against the downstream, upstream side of a rock sill for protection, and then back up the matting on the other side. So this is just one example of a, a utility that you could run into. Um, typically when we run into these, it's oftentimes communication lines and such. Um, also in this picture on the left, you see some stumps that were left we actually had an underground power line that was found during construction. And to avoid damage to that power line, we had to shift our uh, floodplain and slope tiebacks uh, a little bit and also leave the stumps there to avoid damage during grubbing. Next. 
So it's always good. We typically specify tree protection and tree saves on our plan sets, but it's always a good idea to walk uh, the site with the contractor pre-construction to identify any additional trees that could be saved because each contractor has different means and methods, um, different equipment capabilities. So we can specify all we want on the plans, but sometimes it's they can save more and other times there are things that have to get taken out. The photo on the left is a plan view of some brush toes specified in these plans on the right bank on the outside of a meander. Typically we'll put that in to stabilize the bank, break up the velocity vectors in the flow on the outside of the meander, reduce erosion, and decrease energy. Um, in this particular instance, you can see on the right photo that there are some nice mature trees pretty close to that bank. Well, if we kind of look at the drip line of the tree in the rooting zone or the proposed rooting zone, we would see that we'd have to tear out those trees or we would damage those trees to the point where they wouldn't survive if we had installed that brush toe. So in a certain situation like this, it's good to walk with the contractor and identify areas where trees can be saved. These trees can be saved and provide just as much root structure, just as much bank protection in the existing condition as they would have if they were gone and the tow wood was installed there. And now I'm going to uh, pass along to Alex the presentation. He's going to discuss field changes. All right, thank you, Travis. I'm going to dive into, into field changes. Um, and I think this is an important conversation to have because there's a multitude of design variables that go into a restoration project. And there's also a high probability to encounter unforeseen site conditions, whether those are above ground or below ground. And as a result, there's, there's a high probability that the discussion of a field change is going to arise during construction. And when that discussion arises, it's important to know whether you need to take action or if it's an instance where you can allow the stream to stabilize on its own. Um, and to illustrate both of those points, I'd like to look at two examples uh, from a recent project that we did in Central Virginia. And first, I'd like to focus on the tributary that you can see on the left side of the screen, indicated by the green arrow. Um, this tributary required about 180 linear feet of restoration. It was relatively steep um, with an average slope of about 5%. And as a result, we designed this tributary as a Roskin stream type B3 little a. If you look on the right side of your screen, Green, you can see the drainage area delineated in yellow for this tributary. Roughly 15 acres, uh, highly urbanized drainage area. You can see a lot of impervious area. And as a result, this is a really flashy system. So looking at the photo in the top right, this is a, a photo of when we had just completed construction for this tributary. You can see we, we had our rock sills installed, our substrate in place, and all of our matting uh, was placed and staked on both the banks and the valley slopes. So we worked our way out of that area. We moved downstream to continue our construction. And then a month or two later, we got a series of storms that came through. And if you look on the bottom right, you can see that those storms resulted in some scour on both banks of the pools. And this was occurring not only in the pool that you see here, but every pool along this tributary. And so we began to have a discussion with the client and with the contractor about whether we needed to go back into the stabilized area, disturb the matting and the vegetation in order to rebuild these banks or to even design a new pool cross section and implement that new design in this area. Um, but before we took any action, we wanted to dive in and see if we could figure out the reason for this change. So we went to the field and we started taking a bunch of basic measurements in these pools. We were looking at our bank pool top width, we were looking at our max depth, the length of the pools so that we could quantify what was happening. And what we saw is that this system was transitioning from the step pool system that we had designed. You can see a graphic of that on the left side there on the top. And those ratios were starting to transition to more of a plunge pool that you can see on the bottom. These are deeper, wider pools. And basically what the stream was telling us is that due to the flashiness of this system, it really needed more volume in those pools in order to dissipate that energy. And because the system was moving towards stable plunge pool ratios, 
we decided to just recommend the resaking of the matting and just monitor this area to see if it could stabilize on its own. And as you can see from the photos on the right, this is five months post construction and the stream did eventually just stabilize on its own. We got good vegetation growth out there. You can see the photo on the bottom right. There's no longer any scour that's occurring on the banks. And so this one was able to stabilize on its own. So in this case, the best course of action was really to take no action at all. Now, for the second example, I'd like to step through an instance where remedial action was required. This was just a little bit farther downstream. This was along the main reach. Um, it was a 90 foot section and the, it was a little bit flatter at about two and a half percent. And so this stream was designed as a C3 little b. Um, we're going to be primarily focusing on the valley slope on the left side of the channel that you can see in the left photo where the green arrow is pointing. Again, this is an urban drainage area, a little bit smaller at, at seven acres. So here in the top right you can see a photo of when we had just finished the construction for this segment of the main reach the stream grading was done we had our matting done at least on the banks unfortunately we didn't have time to get the matting on the valley slopes before the end of the week so we laid down some straw mulch we left for the weekend and of course we got a gully washer on saturday so we come back on monday and this is what we see in the bottom right uh, we had some slope failure, we had upheaval, and this caused sediment to be deposited within our pools, and it actually shifted the alignment of our constructed channel. Um, so again, and before we took any action, we wanted to figure out why this was happening, because this failure only occurred on this 90-foot segment of the stream. It wasn't happening um, farther downstream in other areas. So we did a little more research, and we found several factors that were contributing to this slope failure. The first, if you look at the photo in the top left, that is an outfall pipe for an AC condensation. Um, it was discharging that water on the top of our valley slopes and causing it to remain saturated at most times. We also had a parking lot that you see in the bottom left that was located adjacent to that valley slope. So anytime that we had a rainfall event, um, that, that runoff was discharging directly to that slope and it was causing the real erosion that you can see in the photograph in the bottom right. We had some really sandy soils too so that um, those particles were easily mobilized and deposited in our pools immediately down, down slope. Um, and then probably the biggest contributing factor as we were starting to do some, some remedial work in this area, we came across a groundwater seat that you can see in the top right. So all of these factors were contributing to saturated soils that were relatively unstable. So because we had so many factors that were causing this, we decided that remedial work was necessary to help this area. So to help it out, we ended up installing super silt fence along the top of the valley slope. You can see that in the photo on the left. That was in order to intercept that sheet flow runoff from the adjacent parking lot. We also installed a temporary PVC pipe to take that discharge from that AC condensation outlet pipe and direct that flow directly to a pool downslope. And then we excavated out all of the saturated soil and we installed dry material. And then finally, if you look at the photo on the right, we installed a valley-wide clay plug to provide additional stability. And, and all of this was done in an effort to just provide temporary stabilization to give the vegetation time to take hold and, uh, and um, give us permanent stabilization in this area. So here you can see these are photos from five months post construction. The measures did end up being effective. Um, the vegetation really took off in this area. Uh, groundwater seeds can be really difficult to deal with from a construction standpoint, but they do provide very nice soil conditions that are conducive to the growing vegetation and that's exactly what happened here. Um, so we're starting to see good growth and we're also seeing some vernal pools beginning to form in our overbank areas, um, likely due to water perching on top of that clay plug. So this is an example of, 
of an instance where remedial work was required. Next, I want to briefly touch on some of the instruments that we use to inform some of our field changes. Typically at a minimum on all of our construction sites, we like to have a rain gauge and a trail camera installed on site so that we can observe this project um, during storm flows and during construction. Additionally, you could install a rain bucket or a stream gauge that you see there on the right if you'd like to have even more in-depth information during storm events. Here you can see some examples from two of our projects of photographs that were taken by our trail cameras during construction. On the top, you can see the base flow conditions for these two different channels. And then on the bottom, you can see what those same channels looked like during storm events. And these are really useful tools to help you sort of validate your design and make sure that these projects are banking out when you expected them to bank out based on the rainfall that you're measuring on site with your gauge. This can allow you to either tweak future designs based on what you observe or even make a change to the current project that's being constructed and implement that as you continue to work your way downstream with your construction. Another benefit to installing these trail cameras is that you get to observe the wildlife that is interacting with your site. Um, these are photos from three different projects that we've worked on. And you'll see that we have foxes in the photos on the left. There are deer in the middle columns there. In the top right, that's a red-tailed hawk that's visiting one of our streams. And in the bottom right um, is a group of wild turkeys. This Sort of amazing thing about these photographs is that all of these were taken on urban restoration projects, ones that had highly developed watersheds. They had um, single family residential homes or apartments on either side, and they had very limited narrow forested corridors, but still we see this diversity of different wildlife on those sites. And so one thing that I would encourage everyone to do as they move forward with their restoration projects is to consider wildlife habitat, not only in rural projects, but urban as well. Um, and one of the best things you can do to providing wildlife habitat is to utilize woody debris in both your floodplain and your stream. Um, this will provide cover for the animals, but it will also work as a uh, food supply for your benthic macro invertebrates. So by adding wood to your streams and your floodplains, you're gonna increase the population of those benthics, which are um, typically the larval state of flies, beetles, and crustaceans that serve as sort of the base of the food chain. And they, they provide food for salamanders, frogs, fish, and so on and so on as it makes its way up the food chain. Um, one of the projects that we constructed recently, you can see the layout of that at the bottom of your screen. For this project, we hadn't designed this to have any sort of wildlife habitat. We thought that it was so urbanized that really we wouldn't have a lot of wildlife interaction. And as we started to ch check our trail camera photos, we noticed that we were getting a lot of, of wildlife visitors um, throughout the construction process. And so we decided that we needed to make a change. We needed to incorporate some sort of habitat and cover for these animals. So we worked up the quick exhibit you can see there at the bottom. We just put in green X's indicating where we wanted the contractor to place some woody debris. And then we gave them a quick detail that you can see in the upper right. Um, and the contractor was able to implement that, as you can see in these photos here. Um, and not only were they just able to implement it, but they were happy to implement it as well, because instead of having to take this woody debris and haul it off site, they were able to lose it on site. And so we were able to use um, harvested materials to provide nice cover and nice habitat. Um, and the idea here is that over time, as this storm experiences, or sorry, the stream experiences several bankful events, it's going to pick up some of that woody debris and more evenly distribute it across the floodplain and maybe even within the stream itself. It's, it's a relatively easy thing to implement that can have significant uplift for the surrounding ecosystem. Um, so again, I would encourage everyone to try and just incorporate as much woody debris as you can, whether you're working in a rural or urban environment. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Travis.
All right, so so now you finished your project and it looks beautiful when you have all this wildlife, but you're not done yet because there's always uh, project closeout items that need to be addressed. Um, typically, we'll make a list, we'll do a walkthrough uh, ourselves and we'll do also a walkthrough with the contractor and make a punch list uh, for items that need to be addressed before demobilization from the site. One of the very first things that I look for on site are issues with the matting because until your vegetation gets up, this is kind of your, your stopper for erosion. So you can see in this picture on the left here where my pen is pointing, there was a depression in the floodplain, which was fine, but the matting, because we're, we love microtopography, um, but we need to make sure the matting has good ground contact to work the way it's supposed to. So in this particular case, that depression was there, but the matting was pulled tight and it wasn't staked down to the ground. It was just spongy when you walked across it. We had an overbank event that came up onto the floodplain, scoured out that depression even, even further and caused some erosion downstream. So we had the contractor come in and fix that. And generally what they would do is pull that matting back, add some new soil fill material, reseed it, straw it, and then restake the matting and then ensure that the matting is staked so that it has ground contact across all topography there. Generally, we'll have them put some extra stakes in as well in these areas. Um, another spot to look for is downstream of sill structures, uh, particularly these bog sills, as shown in this, the pictures in the middle of this slide. You can see in the top picture, uh, it's, it's a little bit hard to see, but you can see there's soil missing from behind that matting where scour happened just downstream of the sill on the bank. Uh, this is fairly common depending on how the uh, log sills are put in and what angle they're put on. But again, we'll make sure that they go back in, pull that matting up, refill that material, pack it in good, seed it, restake the matting. And generally in these areas, you're gonna wanna do split two by four stake stakes to uh, attach the matting into the soil. You'll do them at the toe and at the top of the bank and sometimes in the middle just to hold those spots until they can establish vegetation. The last spot to look for is on tieback areas where you're tying back to existing grade. These are typically slopes. We try to do three to one slopes. Uh, certain circumstances require us to do steeper slopes up to even two to one or so. Um, the picture on the right shows some real erosion underneath the matting, again, from the matting not having good ground contact. So the matting's kind of like the Goldilocks. You don't want it to be too loose. You don't want it to be too tight. It needs to form fit with the ground surface and be staked in well to do its job until the permanent vegetation comes up. So the second thing I would look for on site, um, and you'll typically catch these as construction is progressing, but it's always good to go back and look at the end of the project to make sure you don't see any issues. Rock sills. Uh, when they install rock sills, it's not one giant rock that ties into the bank. Usually there's multiple rocks, there's a footer, set of footer rocks and a set of header rocks that can be, you know, four or five boulders put together. There's gonna to be seams in between those and these rocks aren't perfect squares like Legos. They don't butt right against each other. So you're gonna run into issues where you have some gaps in your rock sills, which can be properly taken care of with, with chinking with stream substrate cobble um, and, and properly stake in the matting. Now, in certain, sticks of cir certain circumstances, like this particular case in the picture on the right, you have a rock sill where the gap was right at the toe of the channel. That's something to always look for because it concentrates water at the toe and you'll see scour on the downstream side of your rock sill. So sometimes if it's bad enough, you'll have to have the contractor remove that rock sill and adjust it and reinstall it. Other times, like this certain situation, we actually had them pull the matting back out and chink that gap with stream substrate cobble, refill the bank with soil sub, uh, soil, and remap that, stake it in well with two split two by four stakes. I've seen certain circumstances where if you can't get it filled with a uh, stream substrate, chinked with stream substrate, you may be able to use a, a dried pelletized bentonite material that'll swell up when the water hits it. It's like a clay and that'll seal those gaps up as well and push that water back over top of the rock sill. Uh, each, each circumstance is different. It's just a field call on whether that thing needs to be completely reinstalled or whether you can fix it 
and monitor it throughout the rest of the construction, make sure it stays stable. Next. So earlier in the presentation, I mentioned tree saves, um, which are always important. We try to save as many trees as possible on these jobs, but occasionally you'll run into is issues at the end of the job where trees get damaged. So this is something you wanna walk through during project closeout and identify any trees that may have been damaged or that look like they're not going to survive and have those taken out now versus later. You can see in the photo on the left here, there's a tree. This project was installed during the winter and during spring when everything budded out at the end of the project, this tree didn't bud out. So we're not sure if this tree was dead before the project started um, or if it was due to some damage, it was a high compaction area around those, around that rooting zone right there where the construction access was. So it could have been from construction, but you can see a house in the left side of the picture. We don't want to cause any damage to homeowner properties. So this is always something to go back and look at to make sure we, we take care of any damaged trees before the contractors leave. The photo on the right here is a image of a tree that a uh, homeowner actually marked himself just out of concern for his property. So occasionally you'll get that. Uh, property owners will come out and they'll ask questions about the trees if there's a little bit of scarring or sometimes they just want all the trees cut down um, to have a bigger yard or whatever. You'll see certain instances where this happens. Uh, that's just going to have to be a field call and a decision you make uh, with the contractor on whether that tree needs to be taken out before the end of the project or not. And Sometimes the liability will fall on the contractor if you catch this at the end of the project before they're demobilized. In certain circumstances, uh, if it's in the permanent drainage easement and we notice the tree is dead later on, the locality will take care of that uh, cost and have that tree removed. It, it's all circumstantial. It kind of depends on the project and the situation at hand. Next out. Last thing we typically like to look for are areas where stream crossings were used over finished work. We try not to do this typically in our designs if we have two construction access points, but some of these designs, because of the constraints that are there, we have one construction access point and our construction goes to the end of the project and they have to come back out the same way. And these areas, you have to put stream crossings back over your finished work, which always little bit of headache during the project. Uh, you'll see in the photo on the left, this is a stream construction crossing. Over a riffle portion of the stream, you'll see a little bit of sediment deposition at the base of the crossing, a little bit of erosion right there where the, the uh, uh, bridge touches the top of banks. Uh, just make sure that this comes out and gets, and everything underneath of it gets repaired before the contractors leave this site. The same riffle where you saw uh, the picture on the left, the same riffle is on the right here looking downstream instead of upstream, but you can see where they repaired that area where that stream crossing was. They pulled the matting back, regraded those slopes, restaked the matting, seeded everything. So just something to keep an eye on. Certain jobs have a lot of stream crossings uh, and it's, it's always a headache during construction, but you wanna make sure it looks good before they leave the site. So, so with that, it ends our presentation. Just as a recap, we discussed some design considerations and constraints and urban stream restorations, uh, focusing in specifically on outfall tie-ins. Uh, and then we kind of transition to everything you want to keep in mind through the construction phases of the project, um, be it pre-construction, field changes, or post-construction uh, site walkthroughs. I think now we can open it up for a question and answer session. Thank you. Um, yes, at this time, we will, be, uh, we will be taking questions from all of our participants. Please use the Q&A tab at the bottom of your screen to submit any questions you may have. And at this time, we actually do have several questions already. Um, so I will go through a couple of them and you guys can chime in with the answers. Um, first up, are there opportunities to retrofit outfalls with water quality features? Um, I, I can address this. Um, so typically our projects center more around sediment transport and we don't always get the opportunity to look at water quality, but I believe that there are opportunities. But I think the idea between the majority of our designs is by 
repairing these outfalls and by lessening the amount of sediment that's moving through that system, we kind of allow the system to get that ecological uplift that Alex was talking about with the macroinvertebrates and just clear water for those living things to kind of grow. We allow for the water quality to improve just by lessening the sediment moving through the system by repairing the outfalls. Thank you. Um, we have gotten a couple questions about the woody debris. Um, so what happens if the woody debris floats during a big storm and clogs downstream? So one measure that you can use to ensure that that doesn't happen um, is to embed some of the larger diameter logs into the floodplain to keep those locked in place and then leave some of the smaller diameter, the one to two inch branches open or unembedded. Um, and that way your, your large material will not migrate downstream and only the smaller material will that you would get with a natural storm anyway. Um, and so it should reduce any clogging issues that you might have downstream, whether that's in channel or if you're worried about a culvert or any other storm system downstream. Okay, and are there any other potential concerns about the woody debris or logs moving during, during storm flows? You would have additional concerns if, if maybe your project is located adjacent to a greenway or something like that where you're going to have a lot of public access and that's definitely something to take into consideration um, and it's very project specific. In this case, this is one where we don't anticipate having a lot of public interaction. Um, it's, it's down valley a decent ways and we didn't incorporate any sort of pathways um, to accompany this stream. All right, um, let's see. The next question we have, are there, are, sorry, are permanent easements placed over the restored stream or riparian areas and who is responsible for ongoing maintenance? Typically a, a permanent maintenance or an easement does have to be secured. Uh, we typically will acquire a permanent maintenance easement on behalf of our client. Oftentimes our client will be a locality um, and that locality is responsible for maintaining this project. Um, typically, a, a visit is done at least once a year um, to ensure that there's no additional scour, that the vegetation is, is taking hold. Um, and if there are any debris jams or anything like that, those would be identified and removed at that time. Okay. Um, going back to the um, woody debris topic, what do, what happens if the wood does float downstream and does end up clogging? If, if, if it does happen to be removed from the floodplain and, and you have a clog downstream, um, that's something that you would identify typically during your yearly maintenance. Um, and it could be removed at that time. Also, you know, there's the chance that you could get a phone call if it is um, a significant enough jam, but that's, that's a problem even with natural systems that haven't been restored is that there's a supply of woody debris and there's always the chance that they can clog um, downstream man-made systems. Okay, um, let's see. How should owners and engineers account for the extreme subjective variability in the bank's analysis and which erosion rate curves are being used for the region? That's a hotly debated topic, the bank's analysis. Um, certain people are and serve people are against it. Um, I guess the first the first step I would take was would be to always do a banks analysis with two people at least in the field. Um, it gives because it is a little bit subjective that gives you two two with two data points to then average together. So I think there have been studies out there. I don't I'd have to look them up and uh, send them to you. But I think there have been studies where they've done that and they've noticed an actual statistically they've noticed a better uh, rating when they've had multiple people doing the analysis. Um, so the second one is to have everyone do in the bank's analysis, read the U.S. Fish and Wildlife uh, BHI field procedures, that's Bank Erosion Hazard Index field procedure. Uh, that should help everyone get a kind of a standardized training. Um, again, it's subjective, but the better you can dial people in using the same resources the more likely you're going to get consistent results. Um, the third thing you could consider doing, which would be a significant amount of work, 
but if you're not comfortable using the banks or you don't think it's accurate for your particular site condition, you could consider installing either one bank pins uh, that you drive in. These are like maybe quarter inch diameter rods that you drive into the bank three feet in or so, so they hold. And then you come back periodically and measure the exposed portion of that bank pin. And then you, based on that, you can estimate feet per year in that cross section of bank erosion and extrapolate it through your reach. Um, you could also do permanent bank profiles or cross sections, uh, maybe a little more accurate than the bank pins because the bank pins are typically putting in two or three pins up the height of the bank. Uh, a, a bank profile or a permanent cross section, you would actually survey that profile with a total station, laser level, site level, whatever you want to use. Uh, but you'll get more data points up the bank to calculate that. And then you can come back since it's permanent, survey it again and overlay those and calculate the cross-sectional area difference. So you can get a, a, a feet per year in that section of stream and then again, extrapolate it through your reach. Um, one thing I would suggest doing, even if you're not from the Chesapeake Bay region, would be to check out the Chesapeake Stormwater Net Network's uh, Prevented Sediment Protocol Report. Uh, it's an expert panel report put together by a lot of stream experts in the region, uh, and they go through a lot of these details on the subjectivity of the banks and Beehive and how to address that, and they have some recommendations there. Um, and the third thing would be the erosion rate curves. Uh, there's several curves you can use, Hickey Run, North Carolina, U.S. Fish and Wildlife, there's Roskins, Colorado Curve, and Yellowstone Curve. Um, in that Prevented Sediment Protocol document I just referenced before, there's a spreadsheet attached to that with kind of a recommended curve, which they take, they take a blended approach. They use different, for different combinations of beehive and airbank stress, they will use erosion rates from different curves available. And a lot of that comes from the fish and wildlife curves and the Dave Grosgan Colorado curve. Um, typically, as of late, we've been using the Colorado curve for a lot of our projects. Thank you. Um, next question. Um, are there different solution stream restorations depending on the type of soils encountered at the site? I think what you would primarily want to look for and by soils, this would more be a wetland thing, but you identify wetlands through your soil. So I think you would want to determine the hydraulic uh, descriptions of those soils. And if they're wetland soils, you may do a channel with riparian wetlands adjacent to it, but generally it wouldn't change the the actual design of the stream, what's going to drive that more in those systems are going to be valley slope and your tie-ins um, from your start and finish point of restoration. And then your stream substrate would, would change what you would use a little bit. But the soil itself, unless it's a really, really sandy where it's heavily erodible, um, you're not really going to have to worry too much about that. Okay, great. Um, next question. How far could you be allowed to encroach into owner's properties in order to make a successful stream restoration design? So that sort of comes down to easement acquisition. We're not technically allowed to work on people's private property without their permission. So that sort of comes down to a conversation between if we're working with a, a county, between the county and the landowner to come to an agreement on actually purchasing easement from their private property to work on their land. So I guess the answer would we're not allowed to encroach into their private property, but we are allowed to encroach once we acquire that easement from them. Thank you. Um, next question. It sounds like there has been a lot of learning from experience over the years. Are there any significant changes that you've made to your design approach after years of stream designs? There have been some significant changes, um, especially if, if we're working in a, a Piedmont region. We used to go a lot more rock heavy with what we were doing, um, using rock sills, using large substrate. And we've certainly noticed over time that wood can often get the job done just as well as rock can. So we're leaning more towards log sills than we are rock sills. Um, even in steeper sections, the logs still hold up well, assuming that you have perennial flow so that you won't have decay of those wood structures. 
Um, and then also we've, we've focused on finding cost effective ways to incorporate uh, wildlife habitat. Um, because although there are other drivers for performing stream restoration, overall we're looking to improve the ecosystem. Um, and so we like to <clears throat> incorporate wildlife habitat to just immediately boost that local ecosystem. Um, we've also gotten away from putting substrate in our pools and just using that substrate <clears throat> primarily in the glides and the riffles. Um, it, so you naturally will have some scour and some deposition in your pools. And so we like to allow that process to play out. Um, and we've been removing substrate from those areas. And it's also a good cost effective measure. Thank you. Um, we have time for a couple more questions. Um, regarding trees in the floodplain areas, do you plant trees in the floodplain areas to provide shade and nutrients to the creeks? Yeah, so we, we always, and typically this is a requirement uh, in RPAs and part of the permitting process, but we always plant woody, woody vegetation in our floodplains, actually across our whole site. We'll go from the stream bank all the way through the floodplain and up the tieback slopes typically. Uh, and we'll specify those species based on the hydraulic conditions in the soils, uh, whether we think it's gonna be a wetland condition like a riparian wetland there, or whether we think it's gonna be an upland slope. Uh, we specify different tree types that can handle that. Um, these trees are typically small. They're bare root trees or small one gallon containers in some circumstances. So they're gonna take a couple decades to get up and provide the shade that you mentioned in your question, but we do we do plant replant trees. Great. Okay, so I think we'll have time for one or two more questions that we have. Um, what information, such as geotechnical or wetlands, do you review in addition to conducting bank studies? So we we typically um, will have a Geotechnical, um, geotechnical work done out in the field will normally take cores um, in areas that are of particular concern, whether we think that there may be a seep in that area, um, if we, we think that we might have bedrock or um, saprolite material, or if we're working more towards the mountainous regions, um, you could be worried about karst topography. Also anywhere that we might propose an oxbow pond or an oxbow wetland, um, we also like to get geotechnical cores in those areas. And they're really vital um, to informing a, a good design. And then we always have our folks go out and do a wetland delineation and make sure that we you know, determine the jurisdictional waters of the US that we have out there, um, as well as any wetland areas, and either try to avoid disturbing those areas or incorporate those wetlands um, into our design sort of just enhance um, the overall ecological uplift of that area. Thank you. Um, so this is going to be our last question since it is almost 11 o'clock um, and it's a situation question. Um, during construction it's discovered the field conditions may have changed from the time of survey and design. If it is apparent the re the reference reaches and data used to come up with the design doesn't fit the current conditions. How should the team of the contractor, engineer, and owner approach the situation? I haven't run into an issue uh, with where it would typically change the overall design conditions. Um, this is generally, from what I've seen, more of an issue with limits of disturbance and grading. Even if the channel down cuts more, typically the valley constraints are the same. Uh, so we wouldn't generally have to go in and change a design if we have just further degradation in the stream. I mean, you might have some more cut and fill or something like that, but it's not gonna change the overall geomorphic parameters that go into our design. I've never seen a situation where the valley, the valley width, the slope, um, and the, I've never seen a situation where that's changed that drastically where your design solution wouldn't really work. Thank you. Um, so that will conclude our question and answer session. Please feel free to call or email today's presenters with any additional questions. 
And lastly, I would like to include that we are offering even more virtual learning courses in the upcoming weeks if you do need more continuing education credits. Please see our website at www.timmins.com for more information on registering. And that concludes our online program. Thank you to our presenters and all of today's participants. The program has ended. You may now disconnect. Thank you again.